No, 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 no. You don't understand. The video may be up and people might even be watching it right now. But you haven't made the video yet. You're not making any sense. You need to familiarize yourself with the second law of thermodynamics. If entropy can be reversed, just imagine the possibilities of time inversion. Oh, like in Tenet! Dude, Tenet's not even out yet. You haven't even seen that movie. Well now, you're the one not getting it. Dude, seriously, what day does that movie come out? Man, I don't know because they keep pushing it back, but I am pumped! So that's gonna bring this video to a close. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We've tackled what can seem like a tricky gameplay feature to implement, uh, that being time travel or time inversion. This video was inspired by my favorite director, Christopher Nolan, and his new film coming to theaters soon or already way out of theaters, kind of depending on how time works. Uh, I do want to give a special thank you to Crystal Clear Game Studios for the basics behind this mechanic. Link to their video in the description down below. We have a few things going on in our final project. Of course, our player character is basically the on and off switch for time reversal. Each frame, every actor that's affected by time reversal records their velocity and location in a list called an array. That's a lot of vectors recorded every frame, so this can get pretty resource intensive if there's a lot in your scene. Just something to keep in mind. When reversal is turned on, we start from the bottom of this list, the array, with all the locations and all the velocities in every frame, we set the actor's location and velocity to that on the bottom of the list. Then we delete that last item, the bottom one on the list, and that's about it. The magic happens. Wait a minute, time's working really strangely in this video. We haven't even made our project yet at this point in time. So let's do that from the beginning. We'll start off with just a basic first person shooter template and that's going to give us an easy way to interact with the actors that are affected by time being reversed. Once we have our first person template project loaded, we'll open the source panels and we're going to have three main things in this video. We'll have our third person character blueprint here, so let's leave that open. We'll also have a new actor, so we're going to do blueprint class actor, create that. We're just going to call this guy uh, BP base reverse. And this is going to be our base actor for reversing time. And these actors and all of the children blueprints are going to be the only actors affected by time reversal in the level. So the level, by the end of it, will probably be full of these blueprints. Lastly, we need a way for this blueprint to interact with this blueprint very easily. And an easy way to do that is with something called a blueprint interface. So we're going to right click on the event graph go to blueprints and we will create a blueprint interface. Just call this something like time control BPI so you remember what it's communicating. If we open up time control BPI, there's really only two things that we'll need. If this is your first interface that you're ever creating, think of it as just communicating functions from one blueprint to another. So our first person character blueprint can tell our actor, hey, go ahead and do this function. There's other ways to communicate between blueprints, but we're just gonna use this way since it's fast and easy for our purposes. Let's go ahead and rename this one reverse, and we're just gonna call that function whenever we want to reverse time, and we're gonna create one more just called forward whenever we want to revert time back to normal. And that's really all we're gonna do with our time control blueprint interface. We can go ahead and close that out after compiling and saving, and now, we can see our first person character. Let's go ahead and implement that interface just by going to class settings and we'll add here. Right now it has no interfaces implemented, but we can just search for a time control blueprint interface. Go ahead and compile and save. Now we have access to these functions, which we probably won't need for our first person character unless you want them to also be affected by time. So the last and final thing we'll need to do with our first person character is just basically turn on time reversal and turn off time reversal. We'll choose which button we want to use. I just want to use the basic right mouse button. Whenever I press it, I want time to start reversing for our actors. And whenever I release it, I want time to stop reversing for our actors. Let's create a variable called rewinding question mark. 
And this is a Boolean that's going to tell us whether or not we are currently rewinding. Whenever we press the right mouse button, we want rewinding to be on. So we're going to go ahead and set rewinding to true whenever we press the right mouse button. And we're going to set rewinding to false every time we release the mouse button. Now after we set our rewinding to true, we can go ahead and get all actors with interface. Now this is a function that will go ahead and just get every actor in the entire level with a certain interface. And we're going to get every single actor with our time control BPI. And for every single actor in this array or the list of actors in our level that are implementing this interface, we want to do a for each loop. If you remember from our common nodes and functions video, this will go through every single actor in this list and it will do something. And that something that we want it to do is start reversing time from its BPI. And it might seem a little confusing, but when we hit the right mouse button, we're going to set our Boolean to yes, we are rewinding. And then we're going to get every single actor in the level that is interfaced with our time control blueprint interface. For all of those, we'll call the function start reversing time. And when we release the right mouse button, all we want to do is the same exact thing, except instead of reversing time, we want to go forward in time. So let's go ahead and plug that in. Maybe bring it down just a little bit. And instead of reverse, we are going to call forward from the time control blueprint interface. And there's a little bit of housekeeping because sometimes you may want to take away the power from your character to be able to rewind time. So we can go ahead and create a branch here to see if we can actually rewind time. We'll promote to a variable. And this variable we're going to call can rewind. I'm going to have this set to true, but if at any point during gameplay you have this boolean set to false, when you right click, you actually won't start reversing time. So if your power gets taken away due to an effect in the game or something like that, you can turn off your power to rewind pretty easily. And just to tidy things up, we'll create another branch here, go to true, and we only want things to go forward in time if we are currently rewinding. So we're going to plug this in here. So if we are currently rewinding, if this is set to true, which it only will be when we hit our right mouse button because it's set to true here, that's when we'll go ahead and start going forward in time again. And that's it for our first person character. Pretty easy. We're just reversing time whenever we hit this button. And whenever we release this button, we are putting time back to normal. And we can close out our third person character now. Now we're going to get to the main subject. This is our actor that we're going to reverse through time. First thing we need to do is obviously implement the interface time control BPI. That way we have access to these functions and when they're being called. If you go to the viewport or if you look at the components panel, you'll see that there's nothing in this actor. We do want the actor to have one component called a static mesh. When you add the static mesh to the actor, go ahead and just drag it on the default scene. That'll get rid of that, and the static mesh will become the root of the actor. I'll do something like just make it a basic shape. If you choose the shape cube, then it should be flush directly with the grid. And now we can do a few things with this static mesh. Perfect. Now we have a static mesh as our root inside of this actor. If we go to the event graph, we can get started. First of all, we want to implement this function for forward and implement this function for reverse. That way, whenever they're called, we do something. And the something we want to do is change another Boolean variable. And this is going to be similar to the one in our first person character. It's just going to be called rewinding. Have the default value be false, but whenever we start reversing, we're going to set that value to true. And whenever we event forward, we are going to set that value to false false. And these are going to be our key for when we're reversing and when we are not. Because the last event that we're going to start using is something called an event tick. Now event tick is something that I try to avoid using since event tick means this event happens every single frame. This can get really resource intensive really quickly if you're doing a lot of calculations off of this event. In this case, we're just logging positions and velocities. So it won't be too insane, but still you do want to avoid event tick as much as you can. We're going to end up having two things 
happen during event tick. So let's do a sequence node right off of the event tick. In every frame, the first thing that we're gonna do is check to see if we are currently rewinding. If we are currently rewinding, the true execute will move the static mesh to its previous positions. If we are not currently rewinding, then we should be recording the positions of the static mesh instead. So these are gonna do two different things based on if we are rewinding or not. Let's do the false path first. This is gonna be recording the positions of the static mesh every frame when we're not rewinding. It's pretty easy to record that information. We'll just have to store it in a variable. So we'll create a variable and this is gonna be called transforms. A transform is a variable that holds data. Like I said before, variables are just information. And the information that it's gonna hold is the static mesh's location, rotation, and scale every frame. So it's not gonna be a Boolean. We're gonna change this to a transform. Go ahead and compile and save. But we don't want just one transform. We want an entire list of transforms. So we'll go ahead and change this from just a single variable to an array. And that's gonna change it to a list of transforms. So this is our list of positions that's being recorded every frame. And we are gonna want the transform of our static mesh. So let's go ahead and drag off of the components panel, drag off of static mesh, and we're gonna get the world transform. And this is gonna happen every single frame. We're gonna go ahead and add this transform value to our list of transforms. Pretty easy to do that, just drag off the return value. We're gonna add it to an array. So off of the arrays, go ahead and choose add. The array that we're gonna add it to is our list of transforms, and we'll do that if we are currently not rewinding every single frame. And before I forget, we actually do need to change one aspect of the static mesh. Right now it doesn't simulate physics. We'll have to do that. Just go ahead and check this button, simulate physics. Compile and save. If we add the blueprint to the level right now, you'll see that it simulates physics. It won't move back in time, but we are logging its location. So we do have a list of where it was. We just need to implement moving it there. And off this branch, the true value is going to be moving it there. Really, all we have to do is get our list of transforms and we're gonna get the last index, which means the last item in that list. We have a whole log of transforms and where they were. We're just gonna go to the very bottom, their most recent transform. And we do need to make sure that it's not the last one in the list. So let's do a branch here. So in order to move our static mesh to the recorded location, we'll just get our static mesh right here and we're gonna set world transform. And it's gonna ask us right here, where do you wanna set that static mesh? Well, I do have that location recorded in this large list of transforms. We are just gonna get a copy of that list, meaning that this is the last recorded location or the most recent location in our list of transforms. And every frame, we're gonna move it there. And after we move it there, we wanna take our list of transforms and remove an index from it. And what index are we gonna remove? We're actually just gonna remove that same index, the last one. That way on the next frame, we'll go to the second to the last one. And after we remove that one, we'll go to the third to the last one. And you can see as we continue doing that, as long as it's not our only index, we're gonna continuously move our static mesh up through the list all the way to its first location every frame. But what do we do if our list of transforms only has the one location because we've deleted all of the other ones? Well, we're still gonna set the world location of that static mesh to our last index, which will just be the only one that we have, and we'll keep it there. And it's gonna stay at that first recorded location no matter what, and this should already work. If you go into your level, you start bumping stuff around, right click, you'll go ahead and move it back. And it's working, you can reverse them through time, but you might notice that they have some strange behavior once you stop reversing time. This is because of their velocities. Because right now the cube is sitting flush on the floor, it doesn't have any velocity, but if I hit it and then return it, it has that same velocity from when it was hit or from when it was returning back to the ground. So it might wobble a little bit. It doesn't appear to smoothly transition through time. And to fix that, we'll have to do the same thing that we did with the transforms, but also with the velocities. We'll have to record them and apply them every single frame. So for our second pin in the sequence, we do still want to find out if we're rewinding time. 
If we're not, we're going to go ahead and start recording the velocities. And if we are, then we're going to start applying the velocities. Should seem a little familiar. We're going to need another array, but this one is going to be called velocities. So now we have another array of transforms that we can use to record locations, rotations. In this case, we're actually just going to use it to record velocities. Off of the false path, we're going to record the velocities of the static mesh every frame. The first one we're going to do is get physics linear velocity. This will come off with a vector, which is the direction that it was going in. The second velocity that we're going to want to get is called angular velocity. So let's drag off of the static mesh and we are going to get physics angular velocity in degrees. Grab our list of velocities and we're going to add to that list. Drag off of the pin here and we're actually just going to make a transform. Even though this is labeled location and scale, we're not actually going to use it that way. We're just going to use the values of these vectors later on. So grab the physics linear velocity, plug that into the location, grab the angular velocity and plug that into the scale. That way those values are recorded, both of them in our one list of arrays. I'll go ahead and move this down a little bit because we're gonna need some space. So now every frame that we are not currently rewinding, we are getting our static mesh's velocity and recording that into our list of velocities. And we'll have to set up every single frame that we are rewinding applying those velocities to the static mesh. So every frame that we are rewinding, we want to do the same thing, get our list of velocities and check to see if we are currently on our last index. Set up a branch to check to see if we're on our last one. We're going to leave the false path blank because we don't need to apply any velocities if we don't have any recorded. So if we're going to apply the velocities, we need to get our static mesh and we're going to set these velocities on the static mesh instead of getting them. So drag off of the static mesh and we're going to set physics linear velocity. And we are also going to set physics angular velocity in degrees. From our list of velocities, we'll do the same thing as we did when we were applying the transforms. We will get a copy of that list. We're going to get the last index, drag off of the transform, and in order to get these individual vector values, we'll have to break this transform. When you break the transform, we'll have our saved location and saved scale. Remember, we used our location for the linear velocity, since linear velocity is plugged into location, and our angular velocity was plugged into scale, so we'll go ahead and plug the scale into our angular velocity. It's important not to mix those up. After we set up the static mesh's velocities, we're going to do the same thing and we're going to remove an index from our list of velocities. And of course, that index that we're going to remove is our last index. And now, very similar to our transforms, every frame, if we are rewinding, we're going to get our list of velocities. We're going to get the last recorded velocity. We're going to set that velocity on our static mesh and remove that velocity from our list. Next frame, we'll get our second to last velocity, set that on our static mesh, etc., all the way until we only have one. Then we won't apply any velocities at all. If we go ahead and play at this point, I've removed everything that isn't our reverse actors from the level, so we can go ahead and push them around and reverse them through time. The good thing about recording velocities is that if you apply an impulse to them, start rewinding, and then stop rewinding, the velocities are still applied to the object. So you can reverse them and have them go forward in time at the exact velocity that they were meant to be going. If you wanted to use some different static meshes with this effect, the easiest way to do this is grab our base reverse actor, create a child blueprint, just call this something like R uh, table. When you go into the child blueprint, in the event graph, you actually won't see anything except for the parent event tick, which means it's inherited all of that code from our base reverse actor. When we go to the static mesh, we can actually change this to something like a table. Compile and save. If we drag that into the level, start shooting it, we can reverse it back that quickly. That's one of the benefits of using child blueprints, and you can have each child have their own unique script as well. And here are some of the coolest uses I've found for this feature. First one being knocking down a tower and reversing time while standing on the rubble to be transported to the top. Uh, the next one being firing a laser at a target's previous location 
reversing time to get them back to that location, and then killing them with the same bullet that was fired earlier. And of course, the best use is picking up all of my dog themed magic cards when they fall on the ground after tilting. What's up, everyone? Joe Von D here, and yesterday we focused on time reversal. It might get a little confusing along the way, but I will definitely do my best to have it make sense in the end. Hey man, what's the next video gonna be about? Um, I don't know. I've been in a time reversal lately, so maybe I can look into that. Isn't messing with time like notoriously confusing? Like that's why Rick and Morty always tries to avoid it until that snakes episode. Yeah, but I mean, it's not like I'd ever create a purposefully confusing tutorial or anything. 